Good morning, guys. So if you could have anything in the world, anything, like what is it that you want more than anything else? Now, don't say it out loud. Here's the thing. This is a Bible college, so like things like materialism, that doesn't happen here, does it? Like we're not, when I say what's, what is it that you want more than anything else, it's not like finance. It's like a, what is that only God can give? Let's put parameters around this. Only God can give. Your heart aches for it. You want this badly, and you know only God can give it. So, so take a moment and think about that thing and just and visualize that. Some of you guys, it's pretty easy. It's, it's at the top of your mind already. I say that, and you're, you've got it. You've been praying about it for a while. This is something that you just you desperately need God to do. If he doesn't do it, it's not going to happen. Some of you guys need a moment. So just take that moment and think about that. And then I'm going to make a statement. If you agree with it, then we're going to do an exercise together. The statement is, God is all-powerful. If you agree with that, let's do a little exercise. If you don't, don't do it. That's fine. Uh, I would say um, go back to class. Get into the word. God is all-powerful. I believe that with everything that I have, that he can and he will, and he does things all the time that are out of the purview of what we consider ordinary or normal. Maybe we'll call it miraculous, miracles. And so here's what I'm going to say. If this is you, if you believe God is all-powerful, put your hands out in front of you. And just take a moment and visualize that thing that you, that you desperately want from God. And take a moment in silence and just pray a prayer. And ask God to give you the desire of your heart. Now as you visualize that, visualize God placing that in your life, in your hands, close your hands, grab a hold of that truth, grab, grab a hold of who God is, and picture that. God, we come to you this morning, and we recognize, God, that you are all-powerful. And God, that you are the one who gives us things that only you can give. And, and because of that, God, we come to you today with humility. We come to you today, God, recognizing that, uh, God, it is only from you. And, and so, God, we give you our lives, we give you our hearts, we give you our minds this morning. God, I pray that you challenge us, you teach us, you grow us here this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. With your fists clenched, with whatever it is God has placed in your hand, in your life, man, I got to tell you, fist clench is a powerful thing. It's easy for us to grab a hold of what God gives us. It's a beautiful thing. I wish that this sermon was 100% just about that, that God's going to give you the desire of your heart, and so just cling on to it and hold on to it and just hold on to that promise, hold on to whatever it is God's giving you. And that's the sermon that I want to preach. That's the conversation that I want to have with you here this morning, that God gives us things and we just hold on to them and that is the way life is. And so that's where we're going to start because that's actually what happens in, in today's story, but that's not where we're going to end. And so I just want to say before we even get started that as you're holding that thing in your hand, I'm going to ask some questions throughout this sermon because it's good that God gives. God's a giver. That's what he does. He gives. And we see a story today in the Bible. If you have your Bibles, we're in 1 Samuel. And 1 Samuel chapter 2 is where we're ultimately going to land. But in order to get there, I want to just highlight 1 Samuel chapter 1. We see the story of this woman named Hannah. And Hannah had this big thing she wanted from God. More than anything else in the world, she wanted this. This thing that, that you just prayed for. This thing that you said, God, only you can give this. Put yourself in Hannah's shoes for a moment. You see, Hannah's issue, in her culture, she could not have children. And this was a big deal. She, more than anything else, wanted to have children because that's what women did. Women went out and they had children with their husbands. That is how things work. If you can't have a child, you just aren't fulfilling your role. In fact, it was a very, very shameful, shameful thing to be able to not have children. That's just a big, big deal. And so she just has this big burden on her heart. She desperately wants to have a son. And so she comes to God, and she comes to God, and she comes to God, and she begs God, and she prays God to God for a son. And as she does this, she's getting this, the, 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 the teasing, the mockery of the town, not just the town, but what the text says is her rival. 
her rival. So there's one person in particular who's constantly taunting her, and this person happens to be her sister wife. Here's the thing about sister wives. If you've ever had a moment where you're just like, well, they did that in the Old Testament. That seems really good. I mean, why, why, why don't we do that here today? Can I just say like it didn't work in the Old Testament? It's just like this, this idea of like, well, it, it's okay because like I could have many wives and then like they're just all going to be happy all of the time and they're never going to get jealous. Right? <laughs> here's, what, here's what happened. Uh, the rival for Hannah was actually her sister wife, Panina. And Panina, here's the thing about her. She would constantly remind her, she'd be like, yeah, I know that, like, I know that he loves you more than me. She, Hannah always got the double portion. She was the one that, like, she was the beloved one. But here's the problem. She wasn't the good one. She wasn't the good one because she couldn't provide children. But Panina's like, listen, I provide the children. I'm the good wife. So she would taunt her all the time. And so Hannah had this heavy, heavy burden. She's just like, man, I can't even provide children. So she goes to the temple, she prays this prayer, and she prays to God, God, give me a child. More than anything else, she wants this child. And she goes to the temple, and Eli is standing there. Eli's the priest, and Eli sees her praying, and as she's praying, she's lipping these words. She's like mouthing these words, and Eli doesn't know what she's doing. In fact, she's kind of crazy in what she's doing. So Eli looks at her, and he's like, man, she must be drunk. She must be completely drunk. She must be out of her mind. And so he approaches her on that, and he's just like, you're drunk, aren't you? Like, like, like get out of here with that stuff. That doesn't belong here in the temple. And, and this is what she makes it clear. She goes, I'm, I'm not drunk. I'm not at all drunk. I'm just praying to God. And here's the thing. She's praying so fervently. She's so much in the moment that it's just, it, it captures his attention. Here's what the text says she prays. It's in 1 Samuel chapter 1, verse 11. She says these words. It says, and, and she vowed a vow to God, and she said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your servant and remember me and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a son, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall touch his head. What she's doing is she's actually saying, God, I'm going to dedicate him to you. Like, I'm going to give everything that he is to you. You give me this gift of a son, and I'm going to give him right back to you. She actually says this Nazarite vow. She's, she's saying that he's going to serve God all the days of his life. So she makes this bargain, if you will, with God. I don't know if you've ever been there. You make a bar, bargain with God. If you just give this to me, I'll give it right back to you. God, if you give me a million dollars, I'll just give it right back to missions and ministry. Like, I don't know if you've ever give, like, made this, like, like, bargain with God. That's what she does. She bargains. But, but what she's saying is she's actually making a vow or a promise. This happens. This is what I'm going to do in return. So she's in the temple. She has this moment. And Eli looks at her and says, hey, God is going to grant you this request. Again, if God is all powerful, and we truly believe that about him. God's the God who can open wounds. This is something only God can do. And so God opens her womb, allows for to her to have a baby, and she has this baby named Samuel. Samuel means for the Lord has heard. It's actually the name of my son, Samuel. We prayed and we prayed for our son before he was born, and, and so we, we named him Samuel. The Lord has heard. God, God was good to us when he gave us a son. So we, uh, we, we, find this, we find this situation now where Samuel then is going to be dedicated to the Lord. Now, I don't know about you. I've been a part of dedication services at our church. Just a few weeks ago, we had a child dedication service. And here's how it looked. We had a bunch of families get up on the stage, and we had parents holding their, their, their children, their babies and their little children, and they're all up, lined up on stage. And here's how it went down. The, uh, there was something that was read over each child. And there was something that we quoted, something that the parents vowed to do in the middle of this, this dedication. It was, it was beautiful. We, we, we prayed over all these children, and then we, we gave them this prayer blanket to give to their children along with a certificate that said that that child was being dedicated that day. It was beautiful. That's the way a child dedication is supposed to be. Apparently, Hannah didn't get the message. Here's what happens, right? So Hannah decides that, that now, like, I'm going to raise Samuel. I'm going to raise him until he's weaned, and I'm not going to go back to the temple. But eventually, I'm going to go back to the temple, but only when the time's right, only for one purpose, and that is to make sure that Samuel then is set aside for the service of the Lord. And so the text says that she goes back to the temple. She has Samuel. Samuel is now weaned. We don't know exactly how old, but he's still young. So he's brought to the temple, and then she stands before Eli, and she goes, hey, remember that crazy drunk woman? 
crazy drunk woman that was praying to have a son? Do you remember the vow that I made that I would like turn him over for the service of the Lord? And then Sam, and, and like, like Eli's like, yeah, I remember that. I remember that. And she's like, well, yeah, here we are. By the way, he's yours. Let, let, let me say this. If anybody gets the idea that that's what it means to dedicate your children, if you drop your child off at my church at Lifespring and say, hey, I'm dedicating him to the service of the Lord, I will call the police. <laughs> that is how that will go down. And not her. Here's how this happened. So she shows up. She drops off her son. She says, I, I'm dedicating him to the service of the Lord. I meant what I said. And now Eli goes, okay, game on. <laughs> Takes this boy and then this boy is now going to be raised serving the Lord. That's all he knew. Samuel ends up being the only, the only person in Scripture we find that is dedicated. He is a priest. He's a prophet. He is, uh, he is also a judge. We find, this, we find this, this man who does incredible things for the Lord set aside from birth. It's incredible what Samuel ends up doing with his life. But make no mistake, it's Hannah who's standing there saying, hey, hey, God, you have done this amazing thing. I asked you for this. And she clenches her fist. You can picture her. God, I want this more than anything else. And Eli says, you're going to get what you are asking for. But she made a promise. She says, as soon as I get him, my goal is to give him up. I don't know about you, but when my fists are clenched, it's easy for me to hang on to things. It's easy for me to hold on. It's going to be hard for you to pry something out of my hand. If you really want to, you could probably do it. You could probably fight it out of my hand. But it's going to be hard. I'm going to fight for it. Because here's the thing about clenched fists. They make really good like, for, like fighting tools, right? And so when you ask God for something only he can provide, be careful. Because here's the thing. When God provides that, I want to ask a question. Who does it belong to? When God provides you the desire of your heart, who does that belong to? Does that belong to you? Or does that belong to God? We're at Bible college, so let's just say it. It belongs to God, Mike. We all know this. It belongs to God. Until you live it. Until you're in the moment. Let me, let me tell you, I talked to a, a woman yesterday at the church that I serve at, Life Spring Christian Church. And I said, you know the story of Hannah? I go, what do you think about that story? She goes, oh, man, I hate that story. So I always wrestle with that story. And I go, why? Why have you wrestled with that story? And she goes, well, for a mom, the idea of me giving up my child, that's just, that's just a bad mom. Like, who gives up their children like that? It's like, for the dedication of the Lord, well, yeah, but that's my job to make sure that the child gets raised up in Christ and is dedicated to the Lord and is, is like, raised up and released. So, like, so, like, the idea of her doing that, like, I just don't understand it. I don't get it. I just think it's bad parenting. <laughs> That's her response, and I'm like, hey, fair enough. The idea of a mom giving up her child, forget about it, if she's worth anything as a mom. Uh, I mean, like, if, if your story is when you have a mom that's engaged in your life, there's nothing she would do, nothing she ever wants bad to happen to you. She wants to make sure that you're taken care of, and some of you guys have parents who are just like hover parents like over you all the time because they didn't want a single bad thing to ever happen to you. Some of you guys come from that background. It's like we're going to wrap you in like, like plastic and like bubble wrap. We're going to make sure nothing bad ever happens to you. You can't even cross the street without us, like, watching you, right? Hannah's like, take him, bye. Not exactly. See, her purpose and her intention was following through on her promise. So I asked the question, wherever it is you prayed for earlier, you clenched your fist, you received that from God. Now God says, give it back. It belongs to me. Now what? Now, Hannah had a response. She could have shook her fist to the heavens. She could have fought and said, no way, God. I've been praying for this forever. This has been the one thing that I needed from you. You gave it to me. I'm not giving that up to you. This is what she does. This is in 1 Samuel chapter 2. She prays a prayer. And so if you have your Bibles, follow along while I read this. There's, there's 10 verses here. It's 1 Samuel chapter 2, verses 1 and following. And it says this, Hannah prayed and she said, my heart exalts in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth derides my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is none holy like the Lord, for there is none besides you. There is no rock like our God. Talk no more so very proudly. Let not arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty are broken, and, but the feeble uh, bind on strength. 
And those who are full have hired themselves out for bread, but those who are hungry have ceased to hunger. The barren has borne seven, but she who has many children is forlorn. The Lord kills and brings, and brings to life, and he brings down to Sheol, and he raises up. The Lord makes poor, and he makes rich. He brings low, and he exalts. He raises up the poor from the dust. He lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and on them he has set the world. He will guard the feet of his faithful ones, but the wicked shall be cut off in darkness, for not by might shall a man prevail." The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Against them he will thunder in heaven. The Lord will judge the ends of the earth and he will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. And she leaves her son in the hands of the temple, in the hands of Eli, to serve. Her fists were clenched as she received the promise of God. And instead of her shaking her fists at the heaven, she opened her hands back up and she said, God, you give and everything you give belongs to you. Recently, I got tested in my own life. Now, it's my wife's story to share. It's her life. But I was along with her for the ride. What happened is she got very, very sick, and we were just making plans. And listen, we're in a good place of our life. God has given us a good life. We're in a good place of our life. We raised our kids. Now we have grandchildren. Now we get to have fun, okay? Let us have our fun. So we were planning on going to Yellowstone, and we had all these plans we're going to make in our life, things that we want to do. And, and, and listen, listen, this is a great time where God's given this to us. We're like, thank you, God. We've earned this. Like, we've done our part. Now we get to go play and have fun. My wife started to not feel good. And I'm like, babe, what is going on? And then she just got worse and worse until she got violently ill. And ultimately, I took her into the hospital, and she was so sick that the doctor said, this is the worst case of what you're going through that we've ever seen in the last 20 years. Now, the bottom line is this. She was very sick. We knew she was very sick. The doctors told us she was very sick. And her body began to swell. She ended up with, with a, a, a ton of extra weight and water weight. And she had infection all the way through her insides. And the doctor said, if she's going to live, she needs to fight for her own life because we cannot do anything for her right now. We went from making plans to literally like that, our lives were thrown in a blender. Now, I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian for quite a while. I've been in ministry for quite a while. And so, of course, I handled the situation by getting down on my knees and saying, God trust you no my life was thrown in a blender my faith was still there I completely believed in God but everything else was shaken I got thrown in this blender I'm listening to the doctors tell me these things and I'm going what like you're telling me that she might die she might be taken from me and they're like, this is a very serious thing. We just want you to be aware how serious this is. If this happens, then this will happen, and this will happen, and this will happen, and she will die. If this happens, then this will happen, this will happen, this will happen, and she will die. And she is in utter pain, and I'm just walking alongside of her during that time, trying to be present. I'm exhausted in the hospital, around the clock, just trying to be by, by her side for this multiple day span until finally, finally she gets to a point where, where her uh, infection starts to go down. But we found out that during that time, her body actually fought not just the infection, but her colon. So her entire colon ended up, being an, um, ended up having necrosis, which means it was, it was dead. So they had to remove her entire colon. Now, my wife is here with me today. This was just a little over a month ago that we got released from the hospital. And listen, God has been so faithful through this whole process. But I'm going to be completely transparent with you here today. In that moment when my life was put in a blender, I did not know even how to think or how to process my feelings, my thoughts, my emotions. I knew that God was who he was. I knew that he was all-powerful. I knew that he was good. But I had a good thing going on in my life, man. I was in a phase of my life where, like, God had given me this opportunity to just enjoy time with my, with my wife, with my kids, with my grandkids. It's a beautiful season, and now I did not want to let that go. And as I stood there, man, I, I, I both trusted God, and I was ready to go to battle, man. I was ready to throw fists like, God, not today. We are not doing this today. I don't know if you can relate to that. 
I don't know if you've been in that situation where you go, God, only you can do this. And God can and he will do impossible things. He does it all the time. But here's the thing about God. God is sovereign. God's got plans that are so far bigger than your plans and my plans. And let me say it like this. Whatever it is you prayed for and you said, God, give that to me, that does not belong to you. There's not a thing in this world that I have that belongs to me. There's not. And as I sit there knowing that God's given me this amazing life, there's not a part of this life that belongs to me. It all belongs to him. And I've got a choice. I can fight it, or I can look at it like Hannah looked at it, and I can say, God, I praise you in the good. I praise you in the bad. I praise you when you give me the things that I think I need, and I praise you when you take them away. God, everything that you have, everything that you have ever given me belongs to you, not me. I like living like this. I love living like this. Because living like this means God's giving me things and I can grab a hold of it. But when he starts to take away, I need to start living like this. And so I want to say a couple of things here as we wrap up and just kind of get you thinking here. I, I believe, guys, that God cares more about the work he's doing in you than he's doing through you. I talked to a man yesterday and this man said to me, he goes, I don't know if you can relate to this or not. He said, but like I was defining myself. He's a businessman now. He said, but I was defining myself by all the things that I was accomplishing. I was, like, I was accomplishing all these things. And people would say like, so tell me about your life. Tell me about your life. And I'd tell him about my list of accomplishments. And I'd set that before, like, in front of him. Them. And then he goes, and then God took all those things away from me. This is what he said to me yesterday. He said, God took all those things away from me. I thought that God, I really, like what matters, what God was doing through me. I did all these things, I accomplished all these things, and yet, here's the truth, God was doing a work inside of him. He said over the last eight months, after God took all of that away, God's been refining him, and he said, you know what, I have less than I've ever had before, and I am more content than I've ever been, because now I know the truth, and that's that God was doing a work in me the entire time. It wasn't what he was doing through me, but it's what he's doing in me. When he came to that conclusion, that reality, that God was doing a work in him more than he was through him, then he started to open up his hands more. You see, when we define ourselves by the things that we accomplish or the things that we think, like, like all these things we think is what defines us. It's like, what's the coolest thing that God's ever given you? Well, I can give you a list of cool things God's given me. The tougher question is, Mike, how do you respond when he takes it away? See, I believe, guys, that like, life is easy to live when God's giving us stuff. But in the storm... When he says, open up your hands because I'm ready to take it away. I've got a plan for that. It doesn't belong to you. Like, open up your hands. That's when he begins to transform you. And that's when he begins to change you in his image. Boise Bible College, I don't know what God is doing in your life or in your spirit right now. And maybe for some of you, it means that you've got to redefine and you have to think. Like, what does it mean for me to let go? What does it mean for me to open up my hands and say, God... I know you're doing a work in me. And some of you guys are going to go on. I mean, you're going to have ministries. You're, you're, like, you're already thinking about all the great things you want to do for God. Can we just come back to the center? Can we come back and remind ourselves that it's not about what we do for God. It's about what God's doing in us. And as he's doing a work in us, then he can do more of a work through us in a way where now we understand, God, you are God and I am not. It starts with God. It starts with his goodness. And so we come to God and we ask. We ask because God asks us to ask. He wants us to ask. It's not selfish to ask. But what is selfish is when we say, now that belongs to me. Voice of Bible College, I want to pray over you as God is doing a work in you and through you here at Voice of Bible College. As you're preparing, as you're doing ministry, I just want to pray that his spirit is present. And that he guides you and he teaches you and he, and, and he grows you in a season of both receiving and letting go. It never stops. And I want to leave you with this thought. There is nothing that you have in this life, no relationship, no physical thing that belongs to you. Thank God for what you have, what he gives you. But don't hold on to it too tightly. Let God do what he wants to do in your life. Let me pray for you. Dear Father, 
Uh, God, this is a big, big thing as we look at this story of Hannah, as we look at the prayer that she prayed, as she praises you. Praises you for giving her what she's always wanted, but she's actually praising you because she gets to let it go. She's praising you, God, that you allowed for this moment where she could then turn her son over to you, to your service. And God, I pray that we can live that kind of a life, that we can give everything over to you in your service. Everything from, our, from our, our relationships, our friendships, our finances. God, the storms that are around us in our lives. And so, God, we come to you and we ask you. There are things that only you can do in our lives, and we ask you, God, for those things. We come to you, Father, and we know that you're the one who gives every good and perfect gift. And as you give that, God, we are grateful. But, God, I pray that we're not grateful for selfish reasons, but we're grateful because we know that you are God. Help us to learn, God, how to, how to receive from you and how to give, God, how to allow you to take back away and to do it with joy, to do it with praise, and to be your people always. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.